Hello and welcome to your final week of contact of content for English 340, Survey of English Literature 1. We're just going to wrap up our discussion of the rate of the lock here. I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of some of the stuff I went over last week and focus it in on a few key passages. Um, this here is, of course, Alexander Pope, one of the key literary figures of the age, one of the great versifiers of the English language. If you are somebody who admires the, the craft of formal poetry, then he's a person that you should look to as an example of one of the greats. Um, in uh, the um, typescript of an early draft of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, there's, there was a long section in, in an early draft that was an attempt to parody Pope and write in Alexandrian couplets. And um, Ezra Pound, who was, who was an early editor of The Wasteland, crossed it all out and wrote in the margin, you can't parody Pope's heroic couplets unless you can write them as well as he does. So just a little little historical, uh, literary historical side note for you. Um, the Rape of the Glock, as we discussed last week, is a mock epic. Um, in Pope's own words, it's a heroic, heroic comical poem uh, written in five cantos. Now, cantos um, is a canto. It comes from an Italian word meaning song, um, and it's the way that Dante divided his um, Divine Comedy, it was divide, each of the books of the Divine Comedy, Hell, Purgatory, and Heaven, were divided into 33 cantos. Actually, the last one was 34 to round it out to a nice, perfect 100. Um, Spencer divided he, uh, the books of his Fairy Queen into cantos. So by invoking this term, um, a pope is sort of putting on the kind of fancy epic uh, sort of um, terminology. But there's only five cant cantos to this relatively short um, narrative poem. Uh, it is, among other things, considered a satire of upper class manners and the youth culture in particular. It's making fun of not just uh, anybody, but, but young people and their rituals of courtship and self-presentation and competition. Uh, Features that are, are part of, I think, youth in, in every age, but he's talking about the upper class of England in the early 18th century, um, a period that is sometimes known as the Augustan Age. This is a term that particularly applies to literature, where writers were self-consciously imagining themselves as the, uh, the heirs or the successors or recreating the kind of literary culture that had prevailed in ancient Rome under the reign of Caesar Augustus. Like, there's some historical analogies, too. Um, under Augustus, in, um, Rome was enjo enjoying a period of peace and prosperity and expanding imperial rule after a period of uh, civil war. And we can also say this about England at the beginning of the 18th century. Um, the poetry of the Augustan Age of England valued not passionate self-expression, not the kind of Miltonic force and grandeur, not the Elizabethan or Petrarchan sort of like deep expression of, of, of personal feeling and love. It was a, more a poetry of reason, of wit. Wit is one of the great values of the age. Um, and this implies um, a rationalism, a kind of emotional restraint. One, one, one is the, one isn't passionless or dead, but one wants to be the master of their emotions rather than mastered by them. Um, it values literature that is polished and well-crafted. Um, it's very much an age that um, values form. Artifice is not really considered a bad thing. The word, you know, artif artificial... Uh, we see as a kind of ne has a negative connotation for us, right? Um, because we see it as false, fake, put on, and a lot of that comes of of the fact that we have never really gotten over or left the age of romanticism. Um, romanticism was, of course, the age that followed this one and rejected so many of its aesthetic values. Uh, and, you know, Romanticism um, valued sort of uh, spontaneous um, kind of uh, form and, and passion and like the, the expression of one's inward soul and it rejected traditional morality, whereas this period um, was very much about, uh, you know, polish, craft, restraint, 
and moral didacticism of, of, of teaching a lesson. It was a period that also rejected the libertinism of the restoration, which we discussed in the, in the previous weeks as well. So this is just a sort of overview of the Rape of the Lock and why we pick it as a kind of representative poem of this age. It has so many of the qualities that um, uh, were celebrated in the Augustan age. Just a re review now of the plot of The Rape of the Lock. Canto One, which we talked about last week and I talked in the, about in the audio lecture, Belinda, the heroine of the story, rises and attends to her morning routine uh, there is in Canto 1 an exposition of the sylphs and who they are and the warning of some dread event. And she, as she rises to put on her, her hair and her makeup and, and everything. Canto, in Canto 2, Belinda say, uh, goes on her adventure, so to speak, in this uh, heroic comical poem. She sails to Hampton Court. Now, this alone should speak to kind of the sphere of society that we're moving in. Hampton Court was a great royal palace. Hampton Court had been built by Cardinal Wolsey for Henry VIII and was a place where the, it was the equivalent of Versailles in, in France, um, not Versailles, Missouri, but Versailles near Paris, um, where, you know, the nobility hung out and wore their big wigs and, you know, fluttered their fans and, and you know, played their, their courtly 18th century games. Um, so she sails forth for there. I'll just go back to this slide for a second. There's the image of, of Belinda sailing to the Thames to Hampton Court, attended by her sylphs. Um, see, that, see, there they are hanging out like, watch out for Belinda. Um, and so, uh, what else? Um, the sylphs are prepared for war. As I, as I talked about, Ariel gives the speech, watch out. Canto 3 is when the action really gets underway. There is um, an epic game of cards where um, the, one of the things that Pope does constantly through this is play with scale where big things seem small and small things seem big. And so imagine the green felt of a card table as a vast plane of battle and all the kings and jacks and, 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 and everything being actual warriors. This is sort of how um, Pope inflates the game of cards into the, the battle, the warfare that is a standard feature of um, uh, epic. Now, Belinda wins her game, and then they all have coffee, um, which is a relatively, still a relatively new innovation at the time. And the fumes of the coffee go to the Baron's brain. He gets all crazy, and he decides to carry through with his plan. He cuts her hair. Um, Ariel can't protect her because of an earthly love lurking in her heart. And she screams, and that's the end of Canto 3. Um, then it gets more complicated. Um, Canto 4, uh, this, we get this whole sort of allegorical digression. The sylphs withdraw, having been defeated, and then there, except for this gnome, who's one of her attendants, named Umbriel, um, which is a, a sort of a combination of the standard um, uh, um, suffix of uh, from Hebrew for the, that the names of angels have, like Raphael or Gabriel or Michael, um, but um, but is combined with this word for shadow, so Umbra. His shadow Sombriel is this sort of like, he's this sort of like gothy, kind of moody, like shops at Hot Topic sort of um, uh, uh, sylph. He's a gnome and he's kind of earthy and associated with kind of the darker emotions. And he flies down to the um, sort of figuratively within her mind, within her body, to the cave of spleen, um, where, the, where all the sort of negative feelings like lurk within her. Um, this is um, Pope playing with, parodying the convention in Epic of the Catabasis. And if you've taken the Gen Ed course here, The Hero's Quest, you might remember this as the hero's descent into the underworld. Here it's the, the underworld of the woman's passion, of her temperament. And he returns to unleash her sighs, sobs, and passions. Um, egged on by her friend Thelestris, which, by the way, is, is a name from, from Greek mythology of, of an Amazon, and Thelestris incites Belinda's rage further in, in keeping with her warrior kind of uh, uh, temperament or makeup. Thelestris then asks her boyfriend, her beau, Sir Plume, to demand the Baron return the curl. Sir Plume does this, and he does it in a way that um, shows uh, Pope mocking young men as equally vain, empty-headed, um, and silly. Um, he is sort of like set up as a kind of 
a parody of what knighthood is supposed to be. He is by rank a knight, but knighthood has not meant for a very long time what it means in the Middle Ages. So um, Pope is sort of playing with the juxtaposition between what knighthood is supposed to mean and the sort of ridiculous figure of Sir Plume, um, who, who uses all this sort of slang, a slang of a kind that Jonathan Swift detests, as, you, as anybody who's taken my HEL course might remember. He, he, was, he tried to eliminate all slang from the English language. Good luck with that. Um, anyway, the Baron refuses. He's like, no, I'm keeping my luck. And Belinda's very upset, and she gives a big speech at the end, which is really interesting, and we're going to focus in on that. And then Canto V um, is the last canto of this story, and it features Belinda's friend Clarissa delivering a moralizing speech about the relative importance of beauty and how you shouldn't be attached to beauty, and beauty's not that important. Everybody ignores her, and then a brawl breaks out. The, the young men are overcome by the frowns of the ladies and, and, and this and that. It's very, it's very humorously told. And finally, Belinda overcomes the Baron by throwing a, a face full of snuff at him, she, which makes him sort of sneeze and his eyes burn. Snuff, as you might know, was a kind of tobacco that was inhaled, it was snorted um, in uh, this period. This was the sort of... Um, it was uh, to smoke tobacco was sort of a lower class thing. The upper class way to enjoy your nicotine was to uh, s uh, snort it in a finely ground uh, uh, powder that was kept in a snuff, bo uh, snuff box, which were often ornately decorated. But in all this chaos, we discover that the lock itself, which everyone's been fighting for, has been lost. But the poet, not the poets, the poet says it has been. Uh, taken up, it's been ap apotheosized. Hold on, I'm going to spell that out for you. Apotheosize. Ooh, that's a big word. Um, which is which is a word for to make something into a god. Like in uh, the ancient Roman world, when a god, when a emperor died, he was said to be apotheosized, turned into a god. So, um, in a way, the the lock of hair is apotheosized and is raised to heaven to become a new star, so that it might be adored by all people through all time. Um, and of course, I think, I think Pope is sort of making fun of the, the humanistic convention that we saw in Shakespeare, right? The, uh, um, but it goes back to Horace, back to the Augustan age, that, that um, a poetry creates monuments that are more lasting and that it can celebrate and raise up the, um, the, 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 the thing that it's representing to eternal admiration. But this raises the question, is Pope really um, holding up the characters in this um, text to admiration? This brings us to a few, a few critical questions. Is this satire or is it romance? Is Belinda meant to be idealized? Um, that's the first one, and let's, dive, let's take a deeper dive into that one. Here's Pope's description of Belinda setting out for war, as it were, setting out for a card party at Hampton Court Palace. Not with more glories in the ethereal plain, the sun first rises over the purpled main, then, issuing forth, the rival of his beams launched on the bosom of the silver Thames. And I guess B B Thames would have been, Bames would have been, that would have been pronounced Bames in the 18th century, pronounced Pronunciations changed. Everything we, that we think is an off rhyme in Pope probably wasn't. But note this lovely epic simile comparing her shining on the Thames with the sun rising over the sea. Fair nymphs and well-dressed youths around her shone, but every eye was fixed on her alone. On her white breast a sparkling cross she wore, which Jews might kiss and infidels adore. Well, well, that's an interesting and provocative little couplet there. So she's beautiful, and she's d d d uh, surrounded by beautiful people, but everybody's looking at her, and on her white breast, a sparkling cross she wore. Okay, so the cross, an image of her religious devotion, one might suppose, her piety. Um, but why would Jews and, you know, these so-called infidels kiss and adore this cross, probably because of its proximity to her. Um, so it's, it's provocative to us, but I think at the time it would have just been 
considered amusing and but and it would have drawn attention to the um maybe the juxtaposition between the earthly beauty that she embodies and the kind of uh, spiritual beauty that the cross was meant to represent. Her lively looks a sprightly mind disclose, quick as her eyes, and as unfixed as those. Well, that's interesting. Her mind is sprightly, so, so you know, uh, quick, uh, full of spirit, full of esprit, the um, uh, quick, quick-wittedness, um, her eyes are quick, they are alive, but unfixed. There's a sense of being kind of all over the place, I think, right? Favor, and this is followed up in the next couplet. Favors to none, to all she smiles, extends. Oft she rejects, but never once offends. So much about her is said in these two lines. Can we say that these lines are about her character? Does this give us a glimpse of who the real Belinda is? What we learn is that she's gracious, that she's well-mannered, and that she is appropriately protective of her, her virtue and her person, right? Uh, oft she rejects, but she does so in a way that does not offend or put off any, uh, anyone. So she's, she's really good at playing the game, right? She is, she is um well she's the she's a top rated player in 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 the social world that she moves in bright as the sun but it, okay here's the other question then that that is important as to whether this is meant to be satirical or not is she truly this gracious is it truly a game is she somebody who's self conscious about how she comes off and what she protect projects or does it just is she just a natural um, bright as the sun, her eyes the, ga the gazers strike, and like the sun, they shine on all alike. Yet, graceful ease and sweetness void of pride might hide her faults if bells had faults to hide. If to her share some female errors fall, look on her face and you'll forget them all. <laughs> I like the little, uh, syncope there the cutting off of the line that's not typical of, of pope um perhaps uh, 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 an, an enactment a performance of the kind of uh way that the vision of this beautiful maid may what cause one to lose oneself but this is a very this is very characteristic of the ambiguity that runs through this text graceful ease and sweetness void of pride might hide her faults if bells had faults to hide, what work is that might doing there? How is that, what, in what direction is this casting doubt or making the whole thing con conditional? Um, how would you rephrase this as a positive? That is an, an affirmative statement. He's saying, first of all, be, um, it, the implication is that bells, that is a beautiful young woman, has no faults to hide. Do you think Pope really thinks this? Second of all, he's saying sweetness void of pride might hide her faults. Is he actually saying that her graceful ease is void of pride, or that if it did exist, it might hide her faults? You can read it generously or ungenerously. You can read it in bonum or in malum, as Augustine would have put it. Um, you could read it both as, as, um, satire, as satire or as genuine admiration and praise and this too i think is part of the augustan ethos this is part of the the way of writing satire that the ancient roman poet horace who is um uh, a new man somebody newly ascended to society in the same way that alexander pope did would both sort of um make fun of the um the foibles and the follies of the upper class that he found himself moving in, moving in, in a way that would make them recognize his portrait and smile at it, but like Belinda herself, not give offense. Um, so th this is this is this is a, an example of the, that that polish, that restraint, that wit, that perfection, and the implicit moral didacticism. Um, 
that holds didacticism is a word that means teaching this right that that it's going to teach you a lesson like an after school special you know the more you know um and and that is that one should be void of pride to be to be socially gracious one should not be um show favors one should not offend people um and so on and some and so forth